So today, again, we have um, a couple of um, different um, items. Uh, firstly, we're going to be talking to Robert Burke, whose practice has just been celebrating 10 years, I think, in practice, right? Yeah. And, uh, as a, and part of that was to make a new uh, website and, um, and book. Uh, so uh, that's a sort of pretext to maybe talk to Robert a little bit about the work that he's been doing, look at a few projects. Um, and then we're delighted to have Phoebe Brady, who's design fellow, I should say Robert Burke is a design fellow in the school teaching currently in, in final year. Excellent. And Phoebe is teaching currently as a design fellow in year two. And she's joined by a UCD alumna, Sarah Dahani, uh, to talk a bit about work they've been doing on sort of urban mapping, a uh, number of projects that they've been involved in uh, sort of taking, I suppose, very interesting experimental approaches to how it is that one maps the urban experience. And there's a little bit of overlap, we hope, with some of the work that Robert has latterly been doing uh, on the urban realm. So maybe um, without further ado, and I should say, as usual, if you have questions or comments or things you want to try to raise, um, please put something into the chat box, either ask a question directly or um, indicate that you want maybe to contribute and that's fine we'll try to come to at the end we'll 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 run for about an hour we'll we'll finish it too uh, so Robert maybe just to go to you straight away thanks for uh, joining us this lunchtime and um, it was great to see I suppose it's a great achievement 10 years in practice a very considerable body of work building up at this stage and so that was it that that prompted you to want to make a website or refresh the website and make a publication or what was the what was the prompt yeah well uh thanks you for for inviting me to this um it's a pleasure to be here um well the i guess the website uh we've been going for about 10 years we've we've had two previous websites and i guess sometimes it's just nice to uh, go through this process of reflection and revision and um, I suppose because we we have been going for about 10 years um, we felt and also we're like like most other small practices practices like we're three people um, we were we've always been where you think to yourself God, I've been doing this for 10 years now it's it's well, I want to spend the rest of my career doing house extensions and you know, I feel like I'm capable of much more than that. So it was also uh, a way to kind of reimagine what we're doing and see how can we actually go after the kind of work that we really want to be doing. Um, and so I have to give a huge amount of credit to the graphic designer that we came across, uh, Brian Byrne from Lands Studio, who we didn't know at all at the start. Um, in fact, he uh, sent us an email um, actually just to, to it was a very charming email actually it was a very good sales <laughs> technique he, he complimented us on uh, our River Chapel project in Wexford which uh, had been think. published and he's based in Wexford and so we started a discussion and I think we I got the feeling that we were on the same page with similar kind of ideas and values and it was really Brian that um, led the way and and it was quite a difficult process because th this all happened mm -hmm. during lockdown sorry do you, want show, do you want to show something of that website well oh, yeah so yeah sharing. that's a good idea yeah. um i will share my desktop which hopefully you can see now yeah and um it's incredibly simple uh i mean you, you kind of look at it and you go you know what's all the fuss about um uh, it's it's uh, Brian's um, approach was to let the content s uh, speak for itself. So uh, Steve Murray, who's done nearly all of our photography over the years, uh, another UCD graduate, um, he provided so mo nearly all the photos are, are from Steve. Yeah. And there's 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 a collection from Alice for from Alice Clancy from one of our first projects uh, about eight years ago there as well and so Brian's approach was just keep it really simple and so we it was even though Brian was doing all of the um, technical stuff 
um, it was still incredibly time consuming just to go back and forth and agree. I mean, it, it's, it's a simple kind of a homepage with a slider, uh, a little practice intro, some news items uh, on, on recent work, and even things like the footer, uh, you know, how, the, the agonizing over how to do the footer. Um, you, you'd laugh if, if you heard the conversations. But how, how do you get the, the newsletter button to, uh, to fit on the screen? And so on, which nobody's using, by the way, actually. We spent a lot of time thinking about the newsletter and actually nobody subscribed. I think maybe 10 people. Anyone listening, please subscribe for our newsletter. Then we'll have an excuse to write one. Um, so, yeah, so that, that was, it was, I guess the, it was actually just going to the project page. Um, we previously had a load of filters at the top for like education, landscape, public, but actually the majority of the projects were homes, they were residential. So Brian's advice was to, because he, he, he's actually very good at um, strategy and marketing and all that stuff that architects don't have a clue about mostly. And uh, he made us do a kind of a, an, he made us really an analyze what we're about and who our ideal client was. And so a good bit of advice was um, kind of present yourself in the way that you would like to be seen by a client. So who is your ideal client? And we thought, well, okay, obviously there's always going to be homeowners. And that, that, I think that would probably always be our bread and butter. It's what pays the bills. But then we, we just simplified it into homes, community, workplace. So community is a direction we kind of started off in with things like place shapers down here with the Irish Architecture Foundation and or this one here and Space for Learning, which was very much about engaging with communities in, 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 in a school in one case and in a neighborhood in another, um, which never let, led to any built work, but I found it incredibly interesting. Um, and then more recently, um, we, we managed to get on a framework with Dublin City Council and were commissioned to um, do a feasibility study for renovating flats in, on Gardner Street. Um, and then there's our mobility program, which we can talk about, and also a, another feasibility study for um, a family resource centre on Hill Street in the north inner city near our office. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because you're based on your your office is based on North Great Georgia Street, isn't it? Yeah. So yeah, exactly. Yeah, the, the beautiful Georgian Street uh, yeah. where we haven't actually we're still paying the rent there, but we haven't been there since March, so it's a bit. And do you think that and that thing of the absence from the sort of remote working did that play a part in let's say hastening your need to make this base this this website base? Do you think there was anything to do with it? Um, it certainly, uh, it certainly, uh, I've actually found home remote working very, very nice experience, I have to say. Um, like um, James Forbes, who's uh, uh, my, my, my other uh, partner at the moment, um, is, is a graduate from TUD of two years ago. And so he's, he's actually a few kilometers away, but we we communicate, we do meet for site meetings and stuff, but most of our communications are by um, WhatsApp, uh, Google Hangouts and um, email. And uh, so having the, and then of course, there's Anna Pierce, who's my associate who's on maternity leave at the moment. Um, but because with lockdown, our workload reduced massively and, and um, it's been me and James keeping things going, but um, having the headspace of working from home, actually, I found good because you could really, it's less distraction and we could focus on, and less work because of the, lock, because of the lockdown, um, things went quite quiet. So we actually had this window. Uh, we actually rang up Brian and said, can you do the website now? Because actually, we don't have a hell of a lot else to do. So, and, and James was able to put a lot of work into it. So there it. is a kind of a pause moment or a, not exactly a pause. It was a pause but, moment. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And no, do you feel that the, do you think the making yes. of the website actually shifted your perspective on your own work? Or, or the, uh, that thing of having to see it in a certain light? Or? Can I add to that? Um, yeah. Did you find that you had to redraw a lot of 
projects as well in the making of the website or fine drawing? Um, were you trying to get a kind of consistent kind of, I guess, style across those drawings and then in, in yeah, the Yeah, yeah. Well, we, we had, yeah, I mean, just looking at, at, at these here, I mean, we, I guess we've been, I suppose, um, over the last couple of years, we've been making a, a much greater effort in how we present ourselves. And I suppose you, you're, you get into a kind of a pattern of, you know that for every project, if it's, if it's an interesting one that you want to talk about, um, you're going to try and get it into the awards. So you know from day one that you're going to be, you need nice drawings. And then you can reuse them for the website. And then you can reuse them for, say, the book that we did. So we were kind of, uh, I guess we've been in that mode for a couple of years. So when it came to actually uh, compiling the content, you had there wasn't a huge amount of extra work involved. But there was a lot of, like these project pages, for example, um, are done like a kind of a, a scrapbook uh of of pains that um you can scroll through and like the like little things like that um were were where mo most of the effort went into but um so I, no i think the answer yeah we didn't redo a lot of work maybe but, another question might be yeah. what, where do you find the 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 website influencing the work that you're currently doing Did you know is it a repository of work done, you know, that's brought to mm. a certain stage, even if it's presentation drawings or panels, or mm. is it something that actually shifts your way of thinking about an approach to a project? Yeah, I mean, you, you, I think it's always something you refer back to because it's, it's like a kind of a, uh, a database or a kind of a, it's a collection. It's a little archive of everything you've yeah. done. So yeah. you, you'll often, you, you might go back even just to, copy a bit of text that you wrote about a project and paste it mm -hmm. in or, or it's an incredibly useful thing from for many many reasons and um yeah even just the process of presenting the projects in these three categories yeah uh kind of convinces yourself that actually this is credible yeah um you know so even though <laughs> Yeah. we uh we haven't done much community work you look at that and you go oh actually actually that's we have we have and 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 you can you can talk about it uh, yeah. with more confidence and and this was in a related way you you also made a book at the same time Do you yes know? yeah i'll switch over to that yeah. actually um It'd be interesting just to see so it. with this is just a little social media actually is another big thing we've been getting our heads around. Can you see that? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, this is the book that again, um, this is, we're, we're all, this is the second time we've had a book flicked through live on screen. Oh, very good. We're only two episodes <laughs> in, you know, what are the chances? This is great. <laughs> Except yeah. you're doing it live. <laughs> yes. You're watching yourself flicking through a book. Exactly. Exactly. I'm glad I cut my nails before I did this. <laughs> um, but yeah, this is all, um, Again, Brian, I mean, we had done something in-house, which, which was really nice. And uh, James put it together and he'd hand stitched the cover and everything. And, but when we, when we, Brian came, and we'd also done a map, like a map yeah, of Dublin with all did. of our work. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is coming at the end, actually. Yeah. And the idea was to, the whole, one of the reasons for the book was to help us act on our work, but also to um, give to clients. It was also a kind of a practical thing of how to generate more work. Yeah. So we thought, well, actually we've, we've done 90 projects. And, and when I say 90, I mean, I'm going wow. from my kitchens, my, my sister's kitchen, uh, all the way up to like a new built house. So uh, that, the, that's why there's so the, many. The map makes it look like you're just dominating the whole. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, yeah, and so. Yeah. yeah. So uh, maybe I'll just I'll I'll, I'll go back to the, yeah. the map and, and pause it. Yeah. Uh, it's a nice book. I'm sorry, just trying to fast forward this. Oh yeah, there it is. Yeah. Um, so the map was um, it started life as as a kind of a, an A2 leaflet thing that you'd fold and you'd you'd we bound bind it in with the book and we'd send it to people, but um, Brian was very keen on integrating the two. So it ended up being part of the back cover and reduced in scale. 
and um, we called it our place in the city and um, what that kind of has two meanings it, it was it was once was um, well one was just to sort of show wh wh where we built and it was also a nice thing for clients to be able to mm -hmm. look at their numbers on the map and say oh there's my project and it's a kind of a little memento and also maybe we, we haven't actually, because of the lockdown, we haven't given any out, but the idea is to say, here, here's a little gift and, you know, keep us in mind if, if yeah. you please recommend us to your friends, yeah. because anyone you've worked for is, is going to be, there's a trust there and they're more likely to refer you. But the other reason is, is our place in the city is kind of questioning ourselves. Well, what is our place in the city? Uh, do we, do we have any impact whatsoever on, on, on the, on, yeah. On the, on, the, on the world in which we're operating and um you know there's there's a lot of kind of extensions in back gardens and you wonder is that having any impact but yeah. it, it you know there's also the kind of the community projects the, the public buildings that we've done feasibility studies yeah. for and yet haven't built but it's it's it was a just good overview um rather than sort of world domination it was more uh, <laughs> where have we worked in the city uh, you know, you can see there's a concentration there around on the area of Down, like that's where yeah. I'm from and that's where, you know, that's where we have... Um, it, it actually, it's, it strikes me, I suppose, first thing we should just, clar you know, reassure people these buildings are not drawn to scale, so, you know... Thankfully, but, thankfully, <laughs> but yes. But the, the, it strikes me as well, it would be, it's a very interesting exercise to do like I'm thinking of even as a piece of research on other architects, like to just map the projects and note mm. Mm. because there's so many projects that people see some, I'm guessing they see a piece of work that you've done on a mm. book or something and they're, it's in their head, you know, yeah. Like, there's that, there's that little network of connections that starts to grow, which is why you probably have, there's a number, a concentration around a certain area of Dunleary right down. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it also, like some of the more interesting areas we've worked are, are the, the fringes of the city, like yeah. out here where we have play shapers, where yeah. you have these much newer communities, uh, yeah. really vibrant places and, and you know, with a lot of um, uh, issues that need to be sorted out, mm -hmm. like kind of public realm type issues. And then there was our, our outdoor classroom here, in, which is actually up in Scaries, which was a, a real learning experience for, for, for good and bad reasons. Um, and so, yeah, it kind of makes you think, oh, well, actually, it would be nice to be open to projects maybe over more over here or more over there. Yeah. And I have to give full credit to James Forbes, by the way, um, for, for actually doing, for creating this map and doing the, all the um, yeah. little drawings. Look great. You can blame him for the um, overscaled. No, 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 no. I think that's a good move. <laughs> that's a good move. Yeah. I was thinking they're not big enough. <laughs> The, the, actually, speaking of the projects, Robert, I'm conscious that we maybe, if do you want to talk briefly about a few of them? I know you had a few identified that maybe it would just be nice to hear a little bit more. Yeah. Um, we'll talk about the yeah. River Chapel, I think. Um, yeah, there's, there's, there's a few. Um, the, this, is, this is just some slides from a talk for the um, RIAI two weeks ago. Um, it was along with it was myself and Grace Keeley from GKMP oh, yeah. spoke with two New Zealand architects based in Auckland and um, Christchurch. And uh, it, the, the, the theme was a sense of place. And we were talking about housing and the landscape. Um, so I introduced the office. There's myself, James on the left and Anna. Uh, we talked about the map. We talked about our early work with the Irish Architecture Foundation the Learning Pavilion, uh, more recent uh, kind of preoccupation with the climate crisis and my involvement with Architects Declare, which mm. I'll put in a plug there. Anyone who's listening who has not signed up to Architects Declare or joined their um, mailing list, please go to their website and do it. Um, some, some community work I'm doing in my own area of Phippsburg where I live uh, this was a submission under Dublin City Council's COVID mobility plan to literally, and I did this in collaboration with a friend, uh, landscape architect, Julia Vavilova, and uh, we, we looked at redrawing the lines on the road to install cycle lanes to make it safer for um, 
for cyclists, um, which uh, is kind of gathering momentum now. Um, although actually, honest answer, uh, we got an email today saying that the DCC have turned it down. So I'm actually, this is going to be a fight. We need to up the ante okay. now on this to uh, mobilize to and uh, figure out how we're going to yeah. get, get this. It's so again, uh, it's, it's not, I guess... Here. The fight back starts here. Just put it on your map, Robert, and then... Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, so, you know, this is just, I guess it's like, as an architect, using your skills of being able to see the, the bigger picture sometimes uh, and, and operate in the community and use your skills that you've... you've uh, now, I, I didn't know anything about traffic um, cycle lanes or anything. And so working with Julia, who knew a little bit more than me, but not much more, um, we put this together and, and uh, it generated a conversation. Mm. Um, yeah, so there, I mean, I can talk about River Chapel, which is the, the, the mm. holiday house, or there's the, the pavilion house, which is the uh, in for the awards at the moment, um, or else there's the uh, York Street um, social housing project uh, in, on Gardner Street, sorry, Gardner Street uh, yeah. social housing project, which is feasibility study we're doing so maybe we should do a, a poll <laughs> uh, so I, I don't mind uh what well, why, don't, why don't you talk would you talk a little bit about the pavilion house then would that be good yes um okay so this uh is this the pavilion house was on the site was this um bungalow uh in um in Dalkey. Uh, I just have to run to the, the door for one second. This is the perils of being at home. Yeah, I'll sure. I'll keep. I'll keep talking. Keep going. I'll be back in ten seconds. Yeah. So we uh, we actually renovated the house next door to it uh, about five years before, and the clients of that project recommended us to the people who had just bought this house, and um, so we ended up because the clients wanted quite a lot out of brief. And it was clear that the house need, was going to need, it needed a huge amount of upgrading anyway, in terms of energy performance and the layout was really bad. Um, and because it had all this space, because it was a corner site, it had all this space at the front. Um, we realized that it would be um, more cost effective to, um, to, to, re to build a new house on this site uh, that would take better advantage of the shape of the site. Uh, but we really liked the, the the fact that there were a row of bungalows, and so that's what inspired the idea to make this house into another big red roof bungalow. Um, but we, because we were adding to the front, we ended up adding like a mini version of the main house to the front because we thought that was the the most elegant way to uh, add volume to quite a distinctive kind of a form how do, how do you add something to such a strong shape so we, we thought well let's do a mini version that kind of attaches to it and um so the this the site actually slopes from the road down to the back and so that um gave us that's why we, we actually stepped the house from from the from the upper level uh down a couple of steps and then down to a sunken area and then down again so the house kind of is on three levels and uh, the plan borrows the idea of, of this recessed porch that you saw at the beginning and there's a bay window as well we have a recessed entrance here into an, a lobby where you have kitchen dining here the, the pavilion as we call it um, because it's a, like a timber pavilion um, is actually a guest bedroom and then there's the uh, master bedroom en suite and utility area, uh, a sunken uh, living area here, uh, which takes advantage of the slope and the site. And it also gives you the headroom to insert a mezzanine living area uh, up, up above that has views down over the kitchen and the hallway. And also a little office here with a window that looks down into the hall. So. The, 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 the couple who, the clients are in their, in their uh, 60s and they're, they're actually downsizing from a, a larger house. And so 
the, this, uh, the, the idea is that one day um, the client will actually will, will, will work from this office here. And then the pavilion also has a little kind of a sleeping platform for grandchildren uh, up within the main roof space with a ladder going up to it. So it's kind of a fun, fun thing. But they're like little and large. They're like mini versions of each other. And uh, the, the, this is actually shortlisted in the award, RAI Awards for Best House at the moment. And so yeah. because the jury couldn't visit, they asked us to uh, make a film. So we worked with Steve Murray again to uh, do a little kind of a walkthrough. And um, th these are some still shots from the film. And so it starts with uh, an overview of, of the house sitting in relation to the original bungalows with the very distinctive red roofs and chimneys, very domestic. And then how you approach it from the street. how the pavilion sits with the main house. The dog was a great uh, model in all these uh, photos. He's not a, a prop going into the main entrance. So even like the tiles were actually borrowed from the, from the original house. So there, there were some kind of elements that were memories of the, and the pebble dash and the, going into the hallway. The house is occupied at this stage, Robert, right? Yes, yeah, it's about a year now. So uh, th it's it's kind of interesting because these these images are a little bit more populated than when we than the ones you see on the website because uh, the the clients have more furniture now and these are Steve's tripods actually they're not um, yeah. clients but yeah, it was interesting to go back and and, and see it um, more lived in. So the kitchen dining area. This is actually a little kind of a bay that projects out. So again, it picks up on the bay window of the original house, then the mezzanine area with with me uh, with a glass of water and then the view up from the uh, sunken den with a, it's got a terrazzo floor so it was mixed because it was more grounded it was so it was more in contact with the earth we we made it more uh, kind of cave like and um, harder materials and just to there was a lot of wood around so we wanted to make the space a little bit more cool temp you know, temperature wise and then just the the view from the uh, mezzanine looking down and then the, these chimney breasts um, actually support the roof so they're actually structural and um, like convincing the clients to go with board mark, mark board marked concrete was a huge discussion which they they eventually came around to and now really love and then up on the mezzanine each of each roof has a big roof light on top, um, which which casts this quite soft light into each space. So there's not. I mean, he's not using lighting in this, is he? Or he's not. No, no, it's all natural. It's all natural light. Yeah. And then you can see where the roof cranks there on the right. That's that's a, a dormer window. The, the things architects love to hate. Uh, a dormer actually made a lot of sense here because it has this incredible view uh, of Dublin Bay uh, from here. So it was really um, important to, to get that in. Mm. Yeah. Um, and then going back down again, looking into the that link that that links that connects these two uh, roofs together is this uh, this little walkway, which you can see it's two steps up. And uh, the idea was that this was re this would read almost like a like a cloister or, or an open um, passageway. Uh, so we 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 conceal the frames uh, of the windows. They're actually standard windows because we've had lots of lots of nightmares with bespoke windows. These mm -hmm. are an off the shelf thing. Well, not off the shelf, but they're factory made. But they're um, we, we, we try to conceal the frames as much as possible by, by putting a cladding panel over them on the outside. Um, then the guest bedroom in the pavilion. These are all solid Douglas fir posts and beams and with a, with a birch ply uh, roof. And this is the little sleeping platform here uh, for, for grandkids. It was actually a very cool kind of a James Bond uh, style 
uh, motorized blind that that uh, closes off this um, window here when they when people want to sleep, and then how the two routes connect materials. And then just finally how it relates to the other houses. Uh, so this was a really important project for us because uh, we it was our third house, but the first house where we actually got to do something quite uncompromising, you know, so where the clients were very open to our ideas and uh, uh, really trusted us to um, deliver our vision for the house and and there was a budget as well to, to be able to do that so that that's kind of like a, yeah. a a dream set of conditions and uh being able to get it into the award like this um it's it's, it's quite it's, it's very important for us so it's been a nice project to mm. to, to get finally thanks robert i mean it's interesting among other things that you would in the end it's visited through the the medium of film so you know we started by talking about the website and so on but there's that there's this use of all these different mediums to try to communicate aspects of the project um yes actually i mean we, we may have time to go into it a little bit in questions later on but just that the the role of the photographer the website maker in in how they see your work as well is kind of interesting and obviously the dog most importantly. Most important. Um, at this stage, we might hand move on, if that's okay. Thank you very yeah. much, Robert, for sharing. Not at all. Pleasure. Yeah. I'll stop sharing my screen. And if there are questions, we will have probably time at the end to come back. Um, but for now, we might move to Phoebe and Sarah to talk to us yep. about urban mapping. Great. Um, thanks, you, And thanks for Thank you very much for to in these conversations. So hi everyone, my name is uh, Phoebe Brady and yeah Hugh said as at the beginning I work with second year architecture here at UCD and I also work as an architect in practice. So I'm Sarah who's going to speak with me today. Um, hi. hi, I'm Sarah Dohney and I'm also an architect in practice. And myself and Phoebe have been collaborating together on sort of design work um, in relation to competitions and also um, in research um, around the realm of architecture as well. So the interests of our um, research practice, which we call Kino, um, lie in the production, the perception and the disruption of public space. So how it is made and designed and the processes involved in that and how is it, it is experienced or understood by its users. And then also how our engagement with public space is always changing, whether it's because of the time of day, the weather, and um, maybe a particular activity is taking place, um, the presence or even the absence of other people in a space. And then, of course, the physical environment, so the architecture itself. So Tim Ingo defines this in his book, The Temporality of Landscape, as how the dynamic effects of time and culture contribute to constant and subtle changes in our perception of space and of place. So even something like um, the pandemic, for instance, affects how we feel in our surroundings and how we react to it. And this, Robert, I think was um, in some of his work, especially his work with um, the, the fifth, fifth row project in the cycle lane. So we're seeing this um, change across our cities and urban spaces where there's this renewed kind of, or a kind of increasing pursuit to reclaim public space. And we find this really interesting because our work proposes a discussion on the lived, I guess, the, what we call the lived reality of space in the city and then the impact of that um, living, I guess, on our shared environments. So in our studies, typically we, oh, sorry, we begin um, by choosing a number of locations to study and we return to document the sites a number of times, sometimes together, sometimes alone. And then we try to weave our recordings into a kind of tapestry or a map that portray um, wider contextual analysis of the sites and then maybe also some more intimate scenes. So by layering sketches and photographic images, we want to assemble these um, constructed situations and invite the viewer or the reader, reader to take a closer look um, at adjacent narratives within what would be a familiar landscape to them potentially. So it's a kind of cartographic practice that we hope starts to illustrate the city as a human geography to find these further social, I guess, yeah, social and, and physical understandings of 
public space and what public space is and what it means. So we produced um, an illustrated essay for building material that portrayed another way that the spaces of the city, its streets, this is Dublin, <laughs> um, uh, doorways, bridges and steps were being used and how this use then challenged our concept of the public and the private realm. So the essay attempts to visually measure the spatial experiences and the social life of disrupted and in this instance domesticated public ground it was highlighting a growing presence of homelessness, the extent of the housing crisis and its urban and social consequences. So as architects we were quite interested in the heterotopia of a home within the city or a living room within the street and how the search for the security and the personal freedom of a home is manifest in these makeshift rooms within the city fabric. But the challenge that we find in our work is in how to represent the experience of a place. So in our studies, we, we adopt this position of surveyors and the approach consists of walking, mapping, recording the public realm, and taking notes of its activity and spatial qualities. Um, because we think observing the city and its movements and its rituals, we think reveals how we each differently perform and respond to daily life, whether it's by choice, by nature, or in this instance, by necessity. Um, of late, we've become quite drawn to the potential that sound has in the design and the transformation of the public realm. So we're seldom very aware of how much we hear, but in fact, our impression of a place and nearly all of our spatial experiences are enriched and reinforced by the acoustic soundscape. So because every space is an echo, depending on its architecture, its form and material, um, it's understood as much through its sound as through its visual shape. It helps us register that feeling that we describe as atmosphere. And it also, we find, enforces a sense of connection, like we collectively hear things, so we, it helps us collectively experience, experience an affinity with a place. So in terms of the built environment, we talk about soundscapes. And the soundscape is essentially a product of how far your ears can hear and the physical context of that place. So the scale of a soundscape can range from a single room to an urban landscape. And we're very interested in the impact and the use of what we call sonic thresholds in these soundscapes and the opportunities that they create for different types of public experience. Um, so for instance, one of the most uh, well, the one we keep returning to are examples of architecture, the architecture of sound in a public space, I should say, is this the front gate entrance into Trinity College. So it's an octagonal vestibule with a solid timber tile floor and groin vaulted ceiling. And it kind of swallows sound and acts as this compression or echo changer, chamber as you leave the busy city and enter the tranquil realm of the front square. So we're going to try and play a recording of this sequence, which we've also tried to describe in this drawing. Um, it's an interesting space, not only because you so physically register the space as you move through it, you kind of return to your body in a way, but it also has all of these odd alternate activities. So people seem to use it as shelter or maybe to pause for a moment and catch up on themselves. And often you find a lot of people taking phone calls in there, again, <laughs> responding to the acoustics of the space. So this recording um, is a minute long. So you just might follow the drawing as you listen. Turn to this. Hopefully, you could register the three spaces yeah. distinctly. <laughs>
So um, our sonic survey of train stations looks at the role sound plays in the physical and visual experience of the traveller. The stations are public places and are experienced collectively. And that experience can be dramatically varied depending on when you're there, the time and the day, and the station itself, the use and context. So our tools of inquiry were recording and drawing observation through the eye and ear. Taking a number of sound trips with a handheld recorder, we focused on four city centre stations in Dublin's Dart Line. And these stations were gateways to the city or destination points. They're very busy during weekday commuting hours, but are also used leisurely on weekends. So Irish Rail collects yearly data on the noise produced by the, the railway lines. They monitor noise levels in decibels by day and night, but do not anal analyze its impact on those who hear it. It's assumed to be negative. Sorry, trying to the slide. So the sound marks for the train travelers become the noises of the train, its whistles and screeches, the distant beeping of the carriage doors opening and closing, the intercom, the ping 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 of the leap cards passing through the turnstiles and the waves of traffic outside. We are immediately gripped by how sound define the sequence of spaces within the stations. Atmospheres of activity, noise and stillness are choreographed by the arrival and departure of the train. Sound comes and goes, but could be perceived throughout the spaces, notifying the listener of the activity kind of taking place around you. To take a train, a pattern of movement is repeated. You walk from the street to the entrance courtyard or hall with ticket collecting points and turnstiles to the platform and step into the interior of the train carriage itself. And the movement is then reversed in order to leave the station. The rooms of a station each have their own soundscape as a result of their architecture, but they can kind of leak in and out of each other and sound connects the spaces and guides the traveller through. You can just kind of hear what is coming and what you've left behind. After listening to the recordings, we made sketches notating the sounds heard, their volume and intensity. We overlaid them onto spatial diagrams and photographic montages, notated with sonically descriptive words. Within most of the station soundscapes, you often hear more than you can see, and this becomes a way of navigation. Because the boundaries of the sonic and the visual are rarely identical, in these drawings, we try to overlap the pattern of moving traveller with the sounds heard onto the space's experience to convey the relationship between the two. So after leaving the Dart Line platform at Connolly Station, you walk underneath the tracks and up into the main train hall, through to the entrance, and finally you exit the station via an escalator to the street below. Dividing the recording into distinct scores, we noted, noted that an abrupt change of their sonic transition points almost mapped directly onto spatial and visual transitions. So we're going to play the recordings for these four scores now. Mm -hmm.
became apparent in the sequence was the containment of sound in each space as the recorder moves through it. The resulting soundscape is intense and dramatic, but lends kind of a sense of place or character to the rooms of the station. And this kind of sonic threshold creates opportunities for different types of public experience. Our intention is to create a kind of noisy psychogeographic map that aspired to demonstrate a layered and multiple understanding of place. So far, we documented the sounds and have begun to investigate the media required to present a soundscape for discussion. So, oh, I was meant to change the slide there, sorry. That's okay. Um, <laughs> producing public rooms, you know, whether they're internal or external with differentiated acoustic to us seems an appropriate ambition in the design of public space. The aim being to accommodate a wide range of needs and activities or to create a sense of place or collectivity. So we've been looking around us or listening, um, I should say, to spaces that we find particularly successful sonically mm -hmm. and perhaps trying to build a kind of library of references. So another example that I was introduced to in Antwerp was a Heinrich Conscious Line in, um, it's in the kind of historic centre. So it's set apart from the busier shopping streets of the city and it's actually surrounded by tram lines. Um, it's also enclosed on three sides by um, the Baroque Jesuit Church and then the Heinrich Conscience Heritage Library. And then to the north um, by a kind of typical Flemish street, which has a number of cafes and shops on the ground floor. Interestingly, the square was the first to be made car free in Antwerp and now pretty much the whole city centre has been uh, pedestrianised. So you can kind of pass by this space along the north in the sunshine, where you also can cross through the square from Volstrat and go under, oh, underneath um, kind of an arched passage here beneath the library. I keep flicking now. <laughs> the square is kind of tapered in plan and it's roughly 33 by 33 metres um, in dimensions and the buildings are about 12 to 15 metre high. And the form and the material of the square make these sonic make the sonic reverberations kind of an ideal place for concerts. So then in the summer, or not only in the summer, but Antwerp's Festival use it for these large gatherings, um, such as in the photos as well as kind of intimate con um, concerts. So a friend was describing um, a string quartet playing in the centre of the square on a summer evening. So it's a kind of a recording that I need to go and find <laughs> and, and capture. I haven't got it yet. But at the same time, it's kind of a secret location in the city um, and it has a very calm atmosphere, so it's perfect for reading. And well, when I was there last, it was one, one of the kind of crazy storms that we had in February. There was a huge amount of wind and it was one of the few places that you could actually have a conversation um, even at a distance from each other because of um, the shelter that it provided. It's also a key part of a sequence of public spaces in Antwerp that provide these alternate environments that can be then interpreted or activated in a variety, in a variety of ways. Um, and we think this is important when we talk about what the inclusive city is or what it might mean. And so this is Mauer Park in Berlin and Mauer Park is a long strip of parkland located at part of the historic site where the Berlin Wall once stood. And its name translates directly to Wall Park. In its wider context, it's bounded south and north, respectively, by the busy Bernauer Strasse and um, this huge train interchange. But what, what I find even more interesting about the park is the diverse sonic experience in travelling through it. It's bifurcated by a wide path from one end to the other. And along this path, you're met with a series of spaces or rooms that swell off that main route. And they invite different kinds of activities, each leading to very distinct sonic zones. So the first zone there starting at one um, is wrapped in a rugged stone which invites you to sit in conversation or take in these kind of informal performances that take place. Next at two and three is um, a basketball court opposite which you find the theatre, an open air theatre for more formal performances. And moving further along again you're met by a uh, bull's court an intimate tree-lined square that often attracts singer-songwriters to busk for the bull players or the passers-by. But lastly, and the most special I think, is um, there's a silver birch grove with a kind of meandering path running through soft ground. The space invited a new behaviour, 
this was a place to read and a place to rest or, or sleep. You often see people hooking up hammocks in the trees. I couldn't help but think of it as a sort of cleansing space as one continues on to the experience, the soundscape beyond of the huge train interchange. So these spaces, especially during lockdown, highlighted the psychological effects of sound, how it can elicit emotion and even evoke feelings of togetherness or, of course, solitude. And now just as a comparative, we're going to play two recordings, one from the first zone and one from the beach grove. You have to listen really carefully for this one. Oh, sorry. pretty close to silence. <laughs> mm. And so to conclu conclude, the urban rooms and sonic thresholds themselves that we are mapping are also transient and fleeting. So there's a nice dichotomy there uh, in their kind of ephemeral nature versus the permanence of recording them. So we've also been thinking about how this type of investigation is applied in practice. We ran a workshop in Venice with second year students in UCD, where as part of their survey work, they set out, uh, set, as, set out as investigators to search for clues and make drawings, but tell the story of public life in the city. And that was to feed into their own work in that kind of context. Cool. Sorry, I seem to have missed that slide again. And that slide is just... Yeah, there is, that's the student examples from, from Venice. Their interpretations of the city, and the different stories that they found, such as the life of the pigeon um, and its perspective <laughs> in the top right, and some other sound um, sound works that they found as well. And then earlier this year, I was working with master students that was in Antwerp um, alongside a local community, and they were under which were undergoing this huge infrastructural change. And the project was to record the challenges of their current and future soundscape and also landscape of their locality. So we're very keen, keen to pursue um, a more engaged conversation with local groups like this or a wider public even to kind of further explore and maybe step out of the role that we have been in as surveyors for a moment and to expand on our research practice. So to that, that's kind of our conclusion for today then. So thank you very much. Thanks, Phoebe. Thanks, Thanks Sarah. <laughs> It was unexpected to be kind of thrust into all those different soundscapes, I think, um, and, and great to be out in the city like that. Um, nice to hear things. <laughs> or to, you know, somehow be having a different exposure to the city. Um, I'm conscious that our, our time is, is actually, we're almost at two, but I'd like to stay on for a few minutes if we can, just to let people know. Um, I'm sure there are questions. I suppose I have one question that, um, the just about whether you where you see the work leading. I mean, I suppose there's this whole idea of mapping as a kind of agency. In other words, mapping like from James Corner that thought that mm. the map is to propose or, or that the natural, let's say, uh, trajectory of mapping could be towards not just analysis of what's given, but pr proposing what might be. And is that in your minds? You know, are you sort of thinking that this mapping is a kind of precursor or a uh, a way of moving into a mode of work that could begun to be more, uh, let's say, uh, propositional. Yeah, I think I think so. I suppose that I, where we see it leading, I suppose, is that in order for it to do that, it, I suppose it was kind of like to like my last point, just about maybe working with particular communities or groups in order to do that. That there is a certain, well, we see it as a kind of maybe 
a sensitive, more sensitive approach before embarking on a particular project or redevelopment or that maybe there is an analysis that has to happen about what is existing at the moment and looking at that from as many perspectives as possible and, mm -hmm. and just trying to um, evaluate it as clearly as possible in the designer's mind but also in the mind of the public that you're working with and that they have a good sense of. Um, so I think it feeds into this conversation about public participation that was kind of ongoing in the practice of architecture at the moment because we are turning to it more and more um, and trying to find methods of doing it as best we can. Mm -hmm. And I suppose, that, well, I don't know, I'd be curious, Robert, even to ask you if you had any engagement in your Phippsburg project or even in some of the more public projects you've been doing and um, the feasibility studies of late and how, if, or <laughs> if you have had that experience, how it has been. Yeah, um, well, it, it was really interesting, such fascinating work um, that you're both doing, um, first of all, um, and a really, a really tricky area to try and um, record and, and communicate because uh, it's so sensory. Um, so like, it's quite an achievement of the, 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 the way you're doing that is, is really interesting. And uh, I, yeah, I was thinking of, say, the, the Phipsro work we've done uh, while you were speaking. And um, I mean, the way we generated interest was by being propositional, by coming up with an idea and then presenting it to local stakeholders. And that was relatively easy because there is quite a strong community uh, organization there called FizzFest. And so once we had met the right people there, then they, they had this whole network uh, at their fingertips. And uh, there was a kind of a credibility then. Once, once we had their trust, then they were able to gain the trust of other people in the community. Um, so uh, I guess, but we haven't done any uh, much, so that was the level of consultation and, and I'm sure there will be uh, other, like we're, we're constantly thinking, because we just found out today that our proposal has been rejected effectively. Yeah. Well, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the core part of it, um, which is to redraw the lines on the road. I mean, we're getting the parklets and so on, which is all great, but I think we need something much more transformative there in, in terms of, and the noise, the noise of traffic, it's, it's actually hard to, hear yourself speak when you're walking down these roads. So uh, I think there's there's definitely a project in that <laughs> if you want to talk further at some point. But um, it's it's I'm really, sorry? I was tempted to go up and take a recording. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, yeah, you, yeah, you should. Um, you, you should because um, I find it's also the, it's the reality of, of our Dublin streets. Once you have this presence of traffic it creates this cloud of almost stress you know it hangs over you uh, whether you're you know you don't have to be on a bike to feel it you, you, it's just a feeling of um safety and and uh, comfort uh that, that we all got during lockdown and suddenly you could actually hear birds sing uh, but now that's all been drowned out again and the traffic situation has gotten worse i think that the trinity example that you started with is just i don't know obviously that you say you keep coming back to it's really powerful, isn't it? Because it, the transitions are so clearly articulated, you know, they're evident. Mm. Uh, and but you really, you really do feel them. That's the thing. And, and that, that kind of, when you leave the noise, well, it's, it's probably not as noisy now. I'm, I'm yeah, yeah. It might change again if it does eventually become but, pedestrianized. But that the intensity outside of the Lewis yeah. and the buses and actually just it being quite mm. hub, you mm. really do you know lose a weight as you move through that space <laughs> very well, the, clear kind of threshold and yeah the, and it has a very clear like sonic signature in a way like a civic sonic signature or something you know yeah. that, that that you can describe the contribution of built fabric in those terms mm -hmm. to say that that is what it offers is yeah. is that which is and it's, it's very it's it's such a an immediately palpable thing when you hear it and yet we so seldom use that register i mean as architects i'm thinking mm. the, the acoustic is not something 
we do talk about it a bit in maybe in specialized and um, specific circumstances, but not as a sort of ever present property of space. Actually, funnily enough, I was talking, I know Grafton's were talking recently about how important in the townhouse project in Kingston, how important the acoustic was in that. Really? Because they knew from the start that they had to put together a library and a dance uh, studio, which was obviously a daft idea. And at the same time, the brief is asking for the whole space to be, to be connected and, and transparent and that's, yeah. So there, that's why the early on they identified this um, acoustic um, insulation that they use in the soffit of mm. the, the whole building, really. Mm. Uh, and Yvonne had a nice way of talking about it as being like a, so with the staircase in the middle of it is like a river. And then as you okay. move away that's from the river, you, you know, you don't hear the sound of it anymore. And as you get closer, you do, which I thought was really nice. But they were saying it was the first time really that the acoustic, what would you say, aspect was, was a sort of formative influence in a design process. Uh, and I think it's partly that thing of just, it's harder to re record and convey. It's not actually, because you just did it for us. <laughs> so you're going, it's not. But, but it's so seldom done, you know? Um, I suppose it's the same, I, I suppose in our work, in the kind of public world, that's what we, it's the same issue that we're finding, that we find is the challenge that, that often when you're asked to design a public space, you're, you're, you're asked for everything. This has to accommodate every person, every, every walk yeah. of life, and yeah. every activity possible. And it just seems slightly Im yeah. impossible. And it's just how can you, and there are loads of successful examples if we kind of yeah. look around. And so I suppose part of our work as well and how it goes is, yeah, that idea about a library of references or something yeah. that could be, yeah. for, yeah. if there is further discussion about it, then there are further, um, yeah, references for people to turn to when they're asked to take on projects that are, yeah. um, can I ask you a question, Phoebe, yeah. uh, on Sarah? Uh, you, you mentioned you're working with students in Antwerp to look at their, I think it was their, the existing sounds, but also to imagine future sounds. Or was that something to, to, to kind of speculate how sound might be, if I understood it's very, and a, a very particular situation in that the mm -hmm. community we were working with live beside a huge motorway. It's basically their, the Antwerp's N50. And what the project, there's a proposed project that Antwerp has as a whole city, which is a very long-term project, to actually put this road underground and make a new parkway mm. on top of the road. So the cars all go under and a landscape sits on top. So the community that we were working with, they, there was three, there's the landscape that they're currently in, which is, they actually don't mind, even though it's <laughs> like unbearable if you don't live there or are not used to it. Um, and then there's, there's when the project is under construction, they have this issue where the road is going to be moved closer to them for maybe 10 years. Mm. And uh, the, that noise that they find okay at the moment is going to be ever closer to them. And then there's the third space, which is the future future, where it actually becomes a park. And what does that sound like? And so the students were kind of going, trying to come up with ways of uh, discussing this with them. Um, and what they wanted to propose was that how you, you might make a kind of sound, mm -hmm. a, a tunnel that actually crosses um, the road itself, like a bridge. Mm -hmm. um, so they developed it into an exhibition, things like that. But it was, mm -hmm. it was very interesting. Um, mm -hmm. There was a lot of different voices from each of the communities. Some people didn't want a bridge. They didn't want to be connected to the other side of the road at all and to that neighborhood and to those people <laughs> and some people you know did um so yeah different priorities 